now is the time for judgment in the church. <laughs> and I say that with a smile because I want us to see today that the judgment of God is a good thing. Go with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. We're going to see what he said about this. And we're going to work through why this is a good and healthy thing for the church. Father, speak to us through your word. Peter said this, it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, these are alien concepts to us in the modern church. We, we try and create an environment that is accepting and as welcoming and as non-challenging as possible. But this is a really challenging idea that actually God wants to judge his church. And not only that, that the gospel itself is something to be obeyed, something to be lived out, not just a set of beliefs to sign up to. So I want us to understand this. And by the end of this, I'm hoping with me, you're going to see this is great. This is really, really exciting for us to move into. But it's going to need a little bit of unpacking. So let's go back to the book of Acts. Acts is the story of the church, right? And Acts is filled with story after story of where they told and retold the gospel. So as you read through Acts, you can't get away with not understanding what the gospel is. So let's start with this obey the gospel or get judged concept. Go with me to Acts chapter 2 and verses 23 and 24. Peter says this, verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So gospel always starts with Jesus. Gospel means good news. Jesus is the good news. His death was for our sins. His resurrection proved it worked. That's my simplistic way of putting it right there. The death and resurrection of Jesus is why the gospel, the good news has power. But his death for our sin, his resurrection as the victorious one demands a response from us. That's the second part of the sharing of the gospel. So go with me now to the end of Peter's sermon in verse 38. This is our response. Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's the promise. Because Jesus has died for our sins and he's risen from the dead for our justification, if we turn to him, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what that word repent means. Now, there's some debate uh, that's gone on and I've heard it preached different ways that the word repent is literally metanoia, meaning to change your thinking. Others emphasize, look, it's it's not change your thinking, it's change your behavior. Like you've got to get your, your life right when you're turning to Jesus. You're turning from your sin to Jesus. Like, which is it? Like, is it like change your thinking or is it change your ways? Let's see Peter preach this again. Because remember, the gospel gets preached again and again and again and again. Go with me to Acts chapter 3 now, verses 19 and 20. Peter says this, Repent therefore and turn back, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. So can you see it's the same promise, the blessing of God, which is actually God himself. It's the blessing of the Holy Spirit. But the condition is repentance. And in this version, he says, repent and turn back. So what's suggested there, it's not just your thinking. It's an, it's an active thing. It's your thoughts and your actions. It's a radical turning, a shift towards God. Now, here's the point. God can't put the blessing in your hands unless you change. Otherwise, the blessing will destroy you. And if you look at what happens to lottery winners, it's like so many stories of people that win like 24 million or whatever, and then they destroy their marriage and their relationship with their kids and end up penniless within a year. But the blessing of God makes one rich and adds no sorrow. So he wants to prepare us so that we can receive his blessing and it won't destroy us. 
That's why in the kingdom of God, financial prosperity comes progressively as we're faithful stewards. Those who sow generously reap generously. That's why the principle of the tithe is such a big deal throughout scripture, Old and New Testament, because it's this demonstration of faithful commitment over time. And to whom is faithful with little? God puts over much. So in this way, he prepares us for increasing blessing. But the blessing Peter's talking about in terms of the gospel isn't money, isn't material goods, not even physical healing. It's God himself. You will receive God himself. So in order to bless you, God has to sanctify you. Let's go to the end of this sermon, the Acts 3 1, verse 26. This is what Peter said. He said, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. The blessing is being turned from the wickedness in order to receive God himself, because that's the real blessing, not money, not power not fame. It's God himself. God being expressed through us. There's a guy called Smith Wigglesworth. He put it like this. He said, look, the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world in regard to sin. So when he's working through you, people around you will start to feel this need to get right with God. But if you yourself are not right with God, he can't work through you because he won't make you a hypocrite. And we can't authentically preach obedience to the gospel coming under the authority of God if we ourselves are living a very different lifestyle. We can say the words, but it won't have the same power. So I would encourage you in this season, actively seek moments of repentance. Like, look for them. Acknowledge you're wrong and bring it before God. I want to be real with you. Like, this week, I've been gutted as God in his judgment has exposed in me pride or selfishness or greed or hypocrisy. (laughs) And like my instinctive reaction in those moments is to be defensive. And I'll either be defensive in like a confrontational way, like, no, you're wrong. Actually, the issue is you. Or I'll be defensive, like in a quiet way, like in my head, like, well, I know I'm right. But although that's my initial response, what I'm learning to do in those moments is actually the opposite of that. Instead of exalting myself defensively to humble myself before God and actually ask him to show me how deep this thing goes within. Because here's the thing, holiness from our part is really only a matter of honesty. (laughs) We just have to be honest and agree with God. The power for holiness comes from Jesus. Only God is good. That's the gospel. God in Christ Jesus gives us his righteousness. Like if you look earlier on in Acts chapter 3, you see Peter heals a lame man, man who'd never walked, like 40 years, grabs the guy, gets him up and says, be healed in Jesus name. And the guy walks. It's this like outrageous miracle. But when the crowd gathers round, Peter says, why do you look at us as though we did this by our power or our piety? There was power there and there was piety, but it wasn't Peter's. It was Jesus. And Jesus was doing a miracle through Peter. And Jesus was also being holy and loving in that moment through Peter. But all the piety, all the power belonged to Jesus. All he's looking for from us is honesty and agreement. Don't misunderstand me, though. Peter acted in power and he acted in in piety. It's this partnership with God. That's why Peter talks about the obedience of the gospel, those who don't obey the gospel, because the gospel demands both a change of our thinking and our behavior in the power of the Holy Spirit. But it begins with humility and honesty. So once again, I want to invite you, look for the moments of repentance this week. They'll come because now is the time for judgment to begin in the household of God. He's preparing us for something, church. Let's get ready. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for all of us as a church, young and old, and all the different backgrounds we come from. 
that God, you'd prepare our hearts for the blessing you long to pour out on your people. Father, help us to recognize those moments of repentance this week and humble ourselves before you and maybe even before each other and confess our sin and be full of the piety and power of Jesus Christ. In your holy name, Lord God. Amen. God bless you, church. You are so, so loved.